Hello, delicious humans. Thank you so much for coming out today to join in the Food Matters team and everyone they've brought together for what is already a really special morning. I hope that what I'm about to share with you just adds to that. So I wanted to bring to life the three pillars in my approach, which are essentially the biochemical, the nutritional, and the emotional, to help you understand the way your body works from the inside out, to help you understand the critical role nutrients play on a cellular level inside you, creating everything you then get to experience through your body. And then, of course, for the emotional component, that's where I help you answer the question, why do you do what you do when you know what you know? because, makes your eyes roll around in the back of your head, doesn't it? Because for most people in this room, it's not a lack of education that would lead you to polish off a packet of chocolate biscuits after dinner. You, you're, you guys sitting there aren't gonna do that and think, oh, I'm gonna feel so great after I do this. <laughs> you, we do it mindlessly, we don't necessarily understand why we do it, we then beat ourselves up afterwards. So as I take you on a journey through those three pillars and those inner workings of your body, one of the foundation principles I want to share with you initially is to remind you that science suggests that humans have been on the planet for about 150,000 years. It's a huge amount of time, obviously. And I want you to picture that length of time like a 30 centimetre school ruler. That's 150,000 years. So one millimetre on that ruler represents 500 years. And now I want you to consider the rate of change that we have asked our bodies to undergo in the last 10 to 20 years. So social media isn't even 10 years old. Our, the fact that we now have emails on our cell phones is, is relatively brand new. So if you think about the last 10 years, it's like a pinhead in the enormous amount of time that we've been on the planet and we are now asking our bodies to live in a very different way from the enormity of time in the past. Processed food is relatively new. It's only been available for the last, say, 40 odd years. Uh, the immediacy at which we feel like we need to respond to everything is all brand new. We've never had to do that. So when we are constantly living in with, with that immediacy and with a perception of pressure and urgency, you're activating a part of your nervous system that communicates to your body that your life is in danger. So when, adrenaline, one of those stress hormones, historically only meant that there was a physical threat to our life. A tiger had come out of the jungle and at that moment you go, oh, and you're ready to fight or run away. And with that stress comes a whole host of changes inside you, as you'll begin to understand today. So your nervous system is, sorry, backtrack a little bit. I went to uni for 14 years, which I know makes me sound really thick, and like I probably failed everything, uh, but I loved learning. <laughs> I could have stayed there forever. I just loved people too much and wanted to get out and communicate the things that I'd learned. So I originally studied nutrition and dietetics and then did a PhD in biochemistry. So as James said, full geek, love it. <laughs> Nothing makes me happier than trying to work, work things out about how the body works. Uh, and then I've gone out and worked with people one-on-one -on -one for over two decades, part of that time in some of the beautiful health retreats around the country. So when I was doing my PhD in biochemistry, I had all of the biochemical pathways of the body mapped out on great big pieces of butcher's paper, blue tacked to my bedroom walls. It was the only way I was ever going to learn it. And when you see the body mapped out as those pathways, you don't just get the deepest appreciation for the absolute miracle that we are, but you get the deepest appreciation for the role nutrients, which we only get from whole real food, you get the deepest appreciation for the role nutrients play in everything. So what's a biochemical pathway? What on earth am I going on about? Here's the best way to picture it. Inside you, substance A is gonna be converted into substance B. Then B becomes C, C becomes D, and on and on those cascade of changes go. But for these reactions to run, you need vitamins and minerals. They don't work unless there are vitamins and minerals there to drive them. So let's say for A to become B, let's say you need magnesium and vitamin B6. If you're deficient in either or both of those nutrients, then substance A will accumulate and you might then not have enough substance B. And then you won't have enough D, sorry, C or D or E and everything else further down the line will be compromised. So when you've got the right amount of A, there's no problem. 
But when A starts to accumulate, maybe it behaves more like a poison for your body. And now you don't have enough substance B, and maybe you need substance B for amazing energy, or restorative sleep, or a calm, happy, content, even mood, or to use your body fat effectively as a fuel. In other words, when we, are, when we become deficient in nutrients, it compromises the biochemical pathways inside of us, and there are consequences to that. It's just that we're not taught to see our bodies like that. One of the things that begins to happen is you start to feel tired. One of my favorite things to say is energy is the real currency of health. For too long, people have made it their weight. They get up, they assess themselves based on this crazy number, on this crazy contraption that just weighs their self-esteem. I care about how you feel when you wake up. If you feel exhausted and you deal with that, your weight will fall into place. Your body is the most extraordinary barometer. What if the parts of your body that upset or frustrate you or sadden you are just messengers asking you to do something differently, to take some new actions, asking you to eat, drink, move, think, breathe, believe, or perceive in a new way? Your body doesn't betray you. It's trying to wake you up. It doesn't have a voice that will only give you symptoms to let you know whether it's happy or not. And energy is a great piece of feedback. So what's life like when you wake up in the morning? Do you think, yes, new day, let's go? Or do you press snooze five times thinking, oh my goodness, how can it be morning? I've had 25-year-olds sit in my office and say, well, like, I'm so like, tired, you know, but like, I'm 25. And my response is always, hashtag you're joking. If you're exhausted and you're 25, we really need to do something about that. <laughs> you should have amazing energy when you're 25. <laughs> So my point is that what we've forgotten is that nutrients drive the inner workings of our body. Your body's made up of about 50 trillion cells and they all want to communicate with one another. But the only way they can do it is when there are nutrients present. And the only place we get the nutrients is from whole real food and I have grave concerns that there are just too many people today not getting the nutrients that are essential for the optimum functioning of all those inner workings because that's what then creates your experience of your life. That's what creates amazing energy. That's what allows you to regulate your sex hormones. It allows you to adapt to stress. It allows you to have a great mindset. What you eat becomes part of you. When you eat your protein foods, they're broken down into amino acids. Those amino acids then become the neurotransmitters in your brain that impact your mood. Those neurotransmitters become the cells that form your immune system, that defend you from infection, help prevent cancer. And those same amino acids also build your muscles, which allow us to carry our groceries and our children. So what you eat actually becomes part of you. And I remember many years ago now doing a radio interview with two guys. They were both hilarious, but one was really passionate and into his health, and the other guy was the exact opposite. And the guy who was really into his health, he's, you know, loving it. Oh, this is great, you know, tell me about this, da-da. And the other guy chimes in right at the end and says, well, Libby, like, this is all well and good, you know, but seriously, if we're all apparently so stressed and people just are eating too many processed foods and not getting the nutrients they need, well, how on earth are we living longer? And it was live radio. And out of nowhere came this question, which is what, how I answered him, and I said, ah, yes, but are we living too short and dying too long? Thank you that that question came. <laughs> because we are, we're going to live longer and longer. We're very fortunate to live at a time where we have access to extraordinary emergency medicine. But what I care about is the quality of your life. What is life like for you now and what's it going to, like, going to be like in the second half of your life? Are you still going to be able to bend over and do up your own shoelaces? You don't want your tummy to have gotten so big that you can no longer reach your feet. Or you don't want to have been so sedentary in the first half of your life that you're now so inflexible that you can't bend that far. And the choices we make today don't just impact how we feel and function today, they're going to impact what that whole future looks like. And the power to change that is in your hands and in your hands only. There's not another soul that can do this for you, no one. The thing is, you've got to care enough about yourself to do it. You have to believe in your own heart that you're worth taking care of. And for so many, for so many people, that's their biggest challenge. 
So let's, let's delve into these inner workings of the body. The nervous system is one of my most favorite body systems to talk about because it has such a profound impact uh, on virtually everything we do. So there are different parts of the nervous system. It's essentially made up of your brain and your spinal column and then all of the nerves that come off your spine and control the inner functionings of your organs. Uh, I'm only going to touch on a couple of systems today, a couple of parts of the nervous system. And you don't need to remember the big, long, silly words. Just get the concepts that I'm sharing. So the central nervous system, the CNS, is under the control of your conscious thinking mind. In other words, you can instruct it. So I can kick my legs, do some squats, speak, stop speaking. It's all mediated through the central nervous system. The autonomic nervous system, the pink love heart, the ANS, it's under the control of your subconscious. And even though that sounds like a hippie la-la kind of concept, all it is is the part of your nervous system that you can't instruct. It has your survival at its heart. But it also controls functions in your body, such as how quickly your hair grows, how quickly fingernails grow. If you cut yourself, you don't have to stand there and say, come on, dude, you can do this, heal over. You don't have to pay it any attention. It's just taken care of. But you can't speed it up. You can't say, well, I've got this cut on my hand and I've got to be a hand model in a few days' time, so can you just heal like in two days and don't scar while you're at it? We can't boss it around is all I need you to understand about the autonomic nervous system. It's controlled by the subconscious. And then there are two branches to the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight response, I call it the red zone, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest, digest, repair and reproduce arm of the nervous system, which I call the green zone. And the challenge for so many people today is that they live constantly in the red zone. They live constantly in that fight or flight response. And it's adrenaline that is driving that. And as I said in the beginning, adrenaline historically for that 150,000 years has communicated to the body that our life is in danger. It's meant that there's a physical threat to our life. But these days, thankfully, we're relatively physically safe. And what leads us to make adrenaline is predominantly psychological stress. So one of them, does any, can anyone guess some of the substances or some of the things that lead us to make adrenaline? Yeah, caffeine, block your ears, caffeine. <laughs> and our perception of pressure and urgency. But what word did I just put in front of the word pressure and urgency? Perception, and that's because it is. And we forget that we get to choose how we see our days. And what so many people have done is they've made what they have to pull off every day. They've made their to-do list, their email inbox, for example. They've made it really stressful and full of pressure and urgency. I, I learn a lot about people when I simply say to them, tell me about your emails. And you can, they don't even have to speak. I can see it in their face straight away. And some people will say, they're the bane of my life. I can never keep up. I always feel like I let people down. Other people say there's a whole world of opportunity right there. So my point is that however you perceive it, however you see it, will then be the biochemical response inside you. So however you perceive things is what then gets created inside you. So if you see a world of stress and pressure and urgency, then you're going to continue to make stress hormones every time you look at that inbox or every time you consider your to-do list or the fact that you've got to get up and get little people out the door and then drop them off there and then do these five things before you even get to work and then meet everybody else's needs for your whole day at work before you pick the little people up again and you go home and then at night, it's up past 10 before you're collapsing at night and you think, I've just completely disappeared into my day. Like You haven't even been able to almost meet your own needs. But I was reminded very powerfully of how this really is a perception when I spoke for an organisation called the Hereditary Breast and Ovarian Cancer Society, so at their annual conference. So that room was filled with, people, with women who had either been told they had the breast, the, sorry, the gene for breast and or ovarian cancer, or they had one of those cancers, or they were, are what I call cancer thrivers, because I don't think you just survive. And at the end, when I speak, I love to answer people's questions, but I usually also have questions of my own. It's one of the ways I continue to learn. Now, I want you to realise or remember that these women were facing all of life's biggest, toughest things all at once. So some of them had a poor prognosis. For some, they had an unknown prognosis. They didn't know if they were still going to be alive at Christmas. 
For many of them, they were under immense financial distress because they'd had to stop work because they were suffering so much with their treatments. Many of them shared with me that their marriages had broken down. And interestingly, a number of them said, I've got teenage kids and their challenges I'm finding pretty tough. In other words, they were juggling all of life's biggest, toughest things all at once. And when I asked each of them individually if they felt like they were living in a world full of stress and pressure and urgency, every single one of them said no. And when I asked how that was possible, what they communicated using their own language, the essence of what they shared was that they just felt so privileged to still be alive. So you don't want it to be a health crisis that makes you wake up and go, this is so magnificent, why didn't I ever see it like that before? Because it's magnificent right now. The, thing, the reason I bring this home to you and the reason that I talk about gratitude so much in what I do, as cheesy as it might sound, is science has shown that the human nervous system cannot focus on two things at once. So good luck with for, to all you multitaskers. <laughs> you can do two things at once, but you can only focus on one thing at once. In other words, when you're focused on what you're grateful for, when you're connected to how extraordinary life is, even if you have tough, tough, traumatic, what really tough stuff going on, if you can be connected to how extraordinary it is, you can't make stress hormones in that moment. So if you can stay connected to what a privilege it is because all of our basic needs are met, and still for too many people in the world that's not the case, you spend a lot less time in that red zone. So most people will say to you that the opposite of stress is calm. I will tell you that it's trust. Because when, whatever you're stressed about, it's actually what you're frightened of. In everything I do, in my Women's Health Weekends, in all my books, in everything that I do, I try to help people get to the absolute heart of what it is really all about. And yes, we have to address the caffeine and we have to address the, the perception of pressure and urgency. We've got to relook at that, absolutely. Got to make sure all the nutrients are going in to give the body what it needs for all those inner workings to occur effectively. Got to do all of that. But if I don't help you get to the heart of why you do what you do, even though you know what you know, if I don't crack that, you'll go back to your old ways every time. So if you can pull the curtain back, if you can actually name what stresses you out, so the things, you might not show this to the world, it might be a very internal process for you, your heart races, you just get really, really flustered or even panicked perhaps, it might be running late. It might be when you think about communicating with a certain person. It might be your email inbox. But if you can pull the curtain back on that and realize that it's not about the thing that you're labeling as stressful, it's how you perceive you appear to other people when you do that. Because when you break everything down, every single thing really is about us avoiding rejection or the pursuit of love just about everything. Because when you run late, what are you worried about? That someone will judge you as being disrespectful or inefficient? If you don't get, yes, it's, I'm not talking about it's not, I'm saying in jobs, of course, we need to be efficient with our emails. I'm not denying any of that. I'm just wanting you to look at your own behavior. When you stress out to the max about that, not everybody does that. And let's say you've got 400 emails every day overnight. Someone else might have 600, but they're as calm as a cucumber about it. So how can those people see that so differently? And it's all to do with those perceptions and how you perceive yourself in that. So when we live constantly in that red zone, in that fight or flight response, a whole host of changes go on inside of us. So what I want you to get is when you're making adrenaline, your body thinks your life's in danger. So it's got to sort you out inside to get you out of that danger. So the first thing that happens is your blood pressure goes up. One in three adults in this country has high blood pressure, and there are many mechanisms causing that, but this is one of them. Number two, the blood supply that is normally so fantastic to your digestive system that allows you to digest things effectively and extract all the nutrients, do that, the absorption and assimilation process of all the nutrients, what allow, one of the things that allows that is a great blood supply. And when you're in the red zone, you don't have a great blood supply to your digestive system. 
It's diverted to your periphery, to your arms and your legs, because that's what's going to power you to get out of the danger that your body thinks it's in. One in five women in Australia have irritable bowel syndrome. It's common, but it's not normal. It's not supposed to be like that. And food is playing a role in that, but so is the stress response. And then the third thing that happens, and for some of you, this will be your biggest takeout today. It changes the fuel that your body thinks is safe to use. So in any given moment, the human body is making a decision which is the best fuel for you to use. Even while you sit there, blinking, heart beating, breathing, some of you are taking notes, all of that requires fuel. And your body is choosing between glucose, or I could say sugar, and fat, or a combination of both. And when you're living in that red zone, when your body thinks your life is literally in danger, it believes it needs to give you a fast-burning fuel to get you out of that danger. So take a wild guess, which is the fast-burning fuel between glucose and fat? Which one? It's glucose. It's the sugar. It's fast. You burn it. So I want you to relate this to energy. Imagine the energy inside you is like a fire burning. There's flames. So we can, we can make the flames get bigger, when we put petrol on that. That's like giving your body glucose. Boom, bang, it's burnt in five seconds and it's gone. If we put wood on that fire, you get consistent, robust, even energy output. Exactly the same thing happens when you start to use your body fat effectively as a fuel. But your body will never allow you to do that while ever it believes it's got to supply you with glucose to get you out of the danger that it thinks that you're in. So yes, it affects how your clothes fit you, it can, but it also significantly affects your energy. How many people these days, you can time your watch by it really in offices around the country, about three o'clock in the afternoon, so many people go looking for sweet food even though they know better. It was a, one of the reasons that I did uh, one of my cookbooks, Sweet Food Story, it was so that people had healthy sweet food made from whole real foods uh, to eat there in the middle of the afternoon. But I meet a lot of people, they make amazing food choices between breakfast and lunch, at breakfast and lunch, and then at three o'clock in the afternoon, they feel like someone else has taken over their body. The sweet cravings are so intense. But you'd have to have your head buried in the sand in this country to think that that was good for you. So we know that it's not, but we still, most people, a lot of people will still do it. And when you give in and you eat a food that you know is not good for you, particularly if you're making efforts in this area, what emotion do you feel? Guilt, which leads you to make another stress hormone called cortisol, which we'll touch on in a second. So then you feel guilty, and quite often what happens, particularly in a female psyche, when she does that, when she eats something sweet there in the middle of the afternoon, she'll say to herself, now I've ruined it. Now, you haven't ruined anything. You just had a biscuit or a piece of cake or whatever it was. You haven't ruined anything. You, you, just, you just made a choice that was not particularly nourishing for your body. Maybe it nourished your soul for a split second, I don't know. But you haven't ruined anything. But because you're telling yourself that now you've ruined it, when you get home, you'll polish off a whole packet of crackers, a whole thing of cheese, you'll be, think you're just going to have one glass of wine, you'll have the whole bottle, and then you think, I've totally ruined it now, and then you have dinner, and then you think, hang on, I may as well have dessert, because what a disastrous day. And you go to bed and you feel really uncomfortable and you lie there in your discomfort, judging yourself, berating yourself, being harsh with yourself, until you remember that it all kind of went downhill at afternoon tea time. So the way you make yourself, better, make yourself feel better temporarily is you think, I know, I won't have afternoon tea tomorrow. But if you live in that red zone the whole next day, you're going to completely set yourself up to go there. Because when your body is just constantly getting the message that it needs to use sugar, not fat as a fuel, your body perceives it's got to top up that fuel tank. Now, I'm not saying willpower or a new level of self-care can't kick in here. Of course it can. From this day forward, every single person in this room can make a decision that right now, when it comes to how they nourish themselves, they're going to raise their standards. When you care that much about yourself, you can make a decision that that no longer belongs in here. It can be that simple. That simple. And I hope today provides you with the fuel to do that. But what I'm wanting to communicate are these ancient mechanisms that are going on inside you that drive so much of our behavior, it's just that we don't understand that that's what's happening. I could literally tell you thousands of stories of people I've worked with over the years who have lost the ability to use body fat effectively as a fuel. 
A lady came to see me uh, after she'd done the New York Marathon. She didn't do it to lose weight, it was on her bucket list. But she couldn't understand how it was possible to gain 12 kilos over the nine months that she trained for it because she was running between 40 and 90 miles per week and she was eating amazingly. She had all her food diaries to show me. It made no sense based on that whole calorie equation, which was first published in 1918, just so you know. That's a story for another day. <laughs> So if the calorie equation really held true, she would have been a stick monster. And she wasn't. She'd gained 12 kilos while she did that training. I had my own experience with that. When I was at uni, I was a mad keen runner. I would run for one to two hours per day, every day. I was slim, happy, healthy, life was good, and I would have sworn to you that I was doing that because it felt good, cleared my head, and I, I enjoyed the feeling. But I can see in hindsight that I was doing that out of fear because it was so ingrained in my education that to maintain a slim figure, you had to exercise like a maniac because you had to burn all these calories. So I can see in hindsight, that's why I was doing it. But then I got a job running a health retreat and my first job of the morning was to teach the guests Tai Chi, which you breathe diaphragmatically when you do that. It's a very slow moving meditation and it was for half an hour each morning in the most glorious setting as the sun rose up and out of the ocean. It's beautiful and it never gets any quicker. <laughs> Even though every Monday morning someone would come up to me after the first class and say, ah, oh, yep, uh, like that was really good and stuff, but uh, does it ever get any quicker? And my response was always, no, and you need to be here every morning <laughs> because clearly it's really irritated you. <laughs> so often what we, what we resist is what we need when it comes to that. So in other words, I went from being Little Miss, tai, little miss Runner burning bucket loads of calories to Little Miss Tai Chi hardly burning any. And my eating remained identical across this period. And yet as Little Miss Tai Chi, my clothes got looser and looser and looser. And it completely fried my brain. Because based on how I'd been educated, the exact opposite was supposed to happen. And it was that experience, coupled with what I was noticing in more and more of my clients, that led me to go back to my geeky biochemistry textbooks with the question in my mind, what leads the human body to get the message that it needs to burn fat, and what leads the human body to get the message that it needs to store fat? And I put those answers into my very first book, Accidentally Overweight, uh, and it's fostered every piece of writing and speaking that I've ever done since. So there are actually nine factors that impact whether your body is getting the message about whether it is a good thing to use your body fat as a fuel or not. And if we look at that picture again, if we look at that red zone concept, you now understand one of those factors. Because when your body thinks your life is in danger, its focus is not on assimilating nutrients effectively. It's not on keeping your blood pressure in a great place. It's not on you using your body fat effectively as a fuel so that you have robust energy and your clothes fit you well. It is to save your life. So how do we get out of it? We've got to activate the green zone. But get a load of this. The only thing science currently knows that allows us to activate the green zone is to extend the length of our exhalation. That's it. And it's why the yogis have known forever, the hippies have known forever that yoga's extraordinary. But it's become mainstream now, and I'm grateful for that. And one of the reasons it, ha it has is because of the intensity that a lot of people live their lives. The universe will always find something to offer us to balance it out. So any breath-focused practice activates that green zone. It might be yoga, restorative yoga, stillness through movement, Pilates, Tai Chi, meditation. They're all breath-focused practices, and of course they can have a spiritual component that allows extraordinary growth. But if that's not where you're at, that's fine. You can connect to the breath and get the immense benefits of activating this green zone. If none of that spins your tires, if you think, oh yeah, I might go to yoga, but you know in your heart you won't, then you just wanna make sure you have a ritual in your day that makes you become breath aware. Because when I walk into a room to give a presentation, let's say it's around a boardroom table, I can't help myself, I look at the way everyone's breathing. And usually the only part of them that's moving is the upper part of their chest, short, sharp, shallow breaths. So their body via their nervous system is getting the message that their life is in danger. And all of those changes that I described with blood pressure, irritable bowel type symptoms, 
sugar utilisation, not fat, that's all going on for them, even though they are perfectly safe. So if you watch a baby breathe, they breathe in and out through their little nostrils and their little tummy goes up and down as they breathe. That's diaphragmatic breathing. And when you breathe like that, when you inhale and your belly comes forward, and then when you gently pause, don't hold your breath, and then you just slowly exhale, your belly shrinks back towards your spine. When you breathe like that, you move your diaphragm and you communicate to every single cell in your body that you're safe. And the reason is because you would never be able to breathe like that if your life was truly in danger. If the tiger really was there, you're not gonna say, oh, just hang on a minute, dude, like I've just gotta drop back down into my diaphragmatic breath, you know? You don't do that because you'll be his lunch, it'll all be over. So the essence of what I've just shared with you is, you know, if, if caffeine is in your world, you want to explore how that affects you and understand that it's not innocuous. For a lot of people today, they, always, they feel anxious all the time. Adrenaline drives that. Caffeine makes you make more adrenaline and can lead you into a very uncomfortable place. So for a lot of people today, caffeine is not their friend because it pushes you into that red zone. So you've got, you want to explore how caffeine affects you. Explore your perception of pressure and urgency. I'm not saying that there aren't things that aren't urgent. If you got a phone call that your child was injured at school, that's urgent. You're going to get there as quickly as you can. But your email inbox, if you've got 400 emails overnight, we tend to see it as a big lump. Maybe 10 of them need your attention quickly, but not all of them will. So explore your perception of pressure and urgency and really connect back up to what a privilege, what a ridiculous privilege life is. And then to activate the green zone, you want to become breath aware. So first thing in the morning can be a great time. Maybe you've got little people that pull your eyelids open, so it's probably not, not a good time. <laughs> Might not be that relaxing. Uh, maybe when you get up to boil the kettle to make your lemon juice in warm water to start the day. It's a good choice to start your day, not the other drinks. <laughs> it might be every time you stopped at red traffic lights, don't check your emails, diaphragmatically breathe. Or at three o'clock every afternoon, you're sitting at a computer, you do 20 long slow breaths. No one will even know you're doing it. You become breath aware, so you start to live from that green zone again. Because that is where nourishment is maximised. That is where all the uh, incredibly important uh, repair work gets done in your body. It's also essential for reproduction. Progesterone is a hormone that women make only after they ovulate, but we make a small amount from the adrenal glands. But because the adrenals are also where you make your stress hormones from, your body links progesterone to fertility. And so for a lot of women today, they're hardly making any progesterone because their body doesn't want them to conceive in a world where they perceive that it's not safe and the other stress hormone, cortisol, says there's no food. But progesterone doesn't just play a role in fertility. I could talk to you about fertility for the next 50 hours till my microphone runs out, <laughs> but park that. The other, role that the other roles that progesterone plays biologically is it's one of the most powerful anti-anxiety agents your body makes for both men and women. It's an antidepressant and it's a diuretic, so it allows you to get rid of excess fluid. So when you're not making enough of that because you're just relentlessly churning out your stress hormones, you're going to retain fluid, feel anxious, and throw to a low mood. And that's even worse when you can see that you've got a life that you know you need to be grateful for, but you can't connect to that, you can't feel that, so then you feel guilty on top of that. And when you're in that place and you've got the fluid retention going on, you feel anxious and unhappy, that impacts the foods that you choose, whether you get off the couch and go for a walk or not, the jobs that you would apply for, the friends that you make, your self-talk, and the way you speak to every single person you love the most in the world. So the ripple effect when we are living on those stress hormones is a disaster. I did a TEDx talk about it. I believe it is one of the biggest challenges facing uh, people's health in the Western world today is that shift to that relentless, constant output of those stress hormones. The next slide that I want to share with you is to do with our amazing liver. <laughs> and when you understand how the liver works, you seriously only ever want to eat whole real food for the whole rest of your life. It was a big reason that prompted me to do my cookbooks, Real Food Chef and Real Food Kitchen. 
There's actually extraordinary technology now coming out of the States where scientists have developed a little camera that you can swallow. It's the size of a vitamin capsule. And you can swallow it, and it gives you about 15 hours of footage from inside the digestive system. It totally spins my tires. And what the researchers did was they gave one group of people a real food meal. They, just made, they made noodles from scratch and served it in a broth with vegetables and water and salt and pepper. And the other group of people, they gave them a bought food meal. So ramen noodles from the supermarket, and you know how they come with a sachet? Rip the top off that, who knows what's in that? Well, you can look it up, it's horrific. Add the water, and then they served it with a blue sports drink. I really should put sport in inverted commas, hey. <laughs> and then you swallow the camera. <laughs> Four hours after the people swallowed the camera and their meals, for the real food people, it was all broken down. There was just white fluff left, and that's how it was supposed to be after four hours. But for the bought food group, you could still see the teeth marks in the noodles. Now, what that suggests is that there are substances in those noodles that you don't have the equipment inside you to break down. Because when you've got food in there and it's been exposed to all of your digestive system equipment, your enzymes, everything, for four hours, there really shouldn't be that much left. But when you can still see whole noodles and teeth marks, that means that there's substances in that food that you have no equipment inside you to break down. And your food, as you now understand, is how you get your energy. Your food is what provides the nutrients for all those cell-cell communications and all those biochemical pathways. You don't want to disrupt that. Plus, the noodles had been dyed blue because the dye in the blue drink was petroleum-based and we have nothing inside of us that allows us to break down petrol. Nothing. And I know it sounds ludicrous when I say it like that, but that's reality. We think because it's on a shelf that it, maybe it's okay. We don't know if it is. Standing in the common sense corner, I would suggest that it's not. So. What we want to do is make sure that our livers are working incredibly well. And if you could see the biochemical pathways through the liver, there's one road in and five roads out. It's why my hand makes a great analogy for this. So every liver loader that we consume, alcohol, caffeine, trans fats, refined sugars, synthetic substances, whether that comes from skincare that goes through our skin or pesticides, the liver has to change those things. Detoxification is a change process. The liver takes substances that if they were going to accumulate in your body, it's got to take them and make them less harmful to you so you can then excrete them. That's all it is. And you want it to happen effectively. But it's not just the substances that you may or may not have in your lifestyle that the liver has to detoxify. It's also substances you make yourself, like estrogen and cholesterol for both men and women. So I'll pick on estrogen. When estrogen arrives at the front door of the liver, doesn't matter your age, menstruation status, your gender, you got it, you're making estrogen because we make it from our body fat and we make it from our adrenal glands. And women of menstruation age also make it from their ovaries. And it doesn't live forever. So once it's run out of puff in your body, it arrives at the front door of the liver and undergoes its first stage of change. Then it will choose one of the five pathways to go down for phase two. And once it's done that, it's gone from your body forever. And you want that to happen effectively. But for so many people, the phase two pathways of the liver are all banked up like traffic on a motorway. So where once things flew through, now they get to this midpoint and they hit a roadblock. So the best way to picture it is that the liver has a trap door and it releases this ever so slightly changed form of estrogen back out into your blood supply and you recycle it. But your body sent it there to be eliminated and now it's back in your blood. And it's this ever so slightly changed form of estrogen that's been found to be so highly linked to our reproductive cancers. Not the one that arrives and not the one that leaves. A study was published showing it was found to be up to 400 times higher in women with estrogen-sensitive breast cancer. So taking care of this organ is so essential, not just to our energy, not just to our body's ability to use body fat as a fuel, to happiness, but it's also essential to our longevity because it plays an enormous role in the body's ability to prevent disease. So it loves real food. You don't have to do extraordinarily flash things. We need to be honest with ourselves about how many liver loaders are going in, and for some of you, they need to decrease. For some of you, they need to go. What you also want to do, though, is focus on eating those whole and real foods. 
And one of the reasons for that is because they provide you with not just vitamins and minerals, but substances that are unique to plants. There are things in the brassica family of vegetables, for example, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts. They contain flash words, flash substances like sulforaphane and indoles. And they actually stimulate some of these really essential phase two pathways. So you want to make sure that you're including so many plants in your world. If the only thing you do after today is double the amount of vegetables you currently eat, for some of you that would change your lives, and I don't say that lightly. It's just I always feel like no one wants to hear that. It's like veggies are so boring. But part of our job today is to show you how amazing and interesting and delicious they are. Lee will do a great job of that later. It's another reason, as I said, though, why I did uh, my cookbooks originally. So we did Real Food Chef originally, which is all gluten-free, dairy-free, refined sugar-free. And then it was, it sold, it was, uh, we only released it in New Zealand. It's not available in Australian shops yet. Uh, and it was the second biggest book, uh, only behind Jamie Oliver's 15-minute meals the year it came out, with no PR, marketing, nothing. Just showed me that people want to eat whole real food. And we followed it up with Real Food Kitchen. Uh, again, gluten-free, dairy-free, refined, sugar-free. So again, there are so many resources out there for you to arm yourself with equipment to take home to really act on this, this whole message. But further, further to that and moving, uh, before I finish, I want to touch on, I guess, the emotional side of things. And I could seriously do this work with you. Uh, I could talk underwater about this for the whole rest of the weekend. So why do we do what we do, even though we know what we know? I don't believe education alone is not always enough to change some people's behaviour. For some it is, but not everyone's. So our behaviour is the outermost expression of our beliefs. The trouble is, most of us don't know what we believe. And you'll have a belief about what food is to you. What do you think food, if I say to an athlete, food is, what do you think they say? Fuel, every time. If you say food is to someone who regularly overeats, what do you think they say? Comfort, love. There's emotion, a lot of emotion usually linked up with it. For, for me, it's nourishment. So when, what we do in every moment of every day is create a meaning of what we're a part of. And this is best demonstrated uh, with a, a lady I worked with many years ago now. She, I'm going to describe her to you so you can visualise her. She was of Irish heritage. She was 60 years old, and she was as short as she was round. And she walked through my doors and said to me, Libby, I want to lose weight, but I can tell you why I have this challenge. It's because I can't stop eating cake. So if your only solution is to tell me to stop eating cake, if it was that simple, I would have done it already. So hopefully you got something else up your sleeve. I went, sure do, come in. <laughs> so down she sat. I asked her my zillions of questions, and then I get to the point in the session where I say, are your parents still alive? And because at that point I've only talked about physical health, People think, I'm telling you all my secrets right now, people think that I'm going looking for physical health. Is there heart disease in the family, for example? And I kind of am, but not really. I'm looking for their response to that question. It's very obvious very quickly if it's calm or chaotic back there. And for her, it was obvious that there was some big challenges. So I asked her to share what had happened with me. And she said, well, my mother died giving birth to me and my father hasn't spoken to me since I was 14. And what she went on to share was that she was born in Ireland and she was taken home to their great big country farm in the middle of nowhere in Ireland and she was raised there with her father and her four big brothers. The nearest brother to her in age was 13, so there was a big gap and she was the only girl. She said it was very quiet, but she really loved it. She was good at school and she helped with the house. But then when she was 14, her father wrote a letter and he put her on a boat and sent her to New Zealand and she never heard from him again. But here's the kicker, here's the belief. She said, he loved my brothers enough to keep them. He didn't love me enough to keep me. So whatever your thing is, overeating, just having too much, eating food that is not nutritious, so eating food that doesn't serve you, so you know better, but you still eat food that's not nourishing. Undereating, whatever it is that you do where in your heart you know better, you drink too much alcohol, whatever it is, and you know you know better, it is never about the stuff. 
It's never about the food. It is never about the alcohol. It is the way you distance yourself from the way things are when they're not how you want them to be. I cannot say it any simpler. So she didn't sit on the couch every night going, my dad doesn't love me, I better eat cake. It's not conscious. It's all done through that autonomic nervous system, the part that you can't boss around. But I believe that humans have beautiful hearts. Their behaviour doesn't always demonstrate that, I know, but I believe they have beautiful hearts. And so I said to her, what if the exact opposite is true? What if he sent you away because he loved you so much and he was prepared to break his own heart and never see his one and only daughter again to give her a better life? You were 14, you were probably just about to menstruate, he probably wanted you to be raised by a female. You said you were good at school, he probably wanted you to have access to education that was nowhere near this great big farm where you were. So what if he sent you away because he loved you so much? And she said, I've never thought about it like that. And I said, well, you said he's still alive. Is there any way you could get in touch with him? And she said, I could probably get a phone number. And I said, well, why don't you call him and ask him why he sent you away? And to my absolute astonishment, she found the courage inside of herself to ring him and ask him why he sent her away. And he gave her a version of what I just said to you. So she lived her life in the cloud of false belief from the age of 14 to the age of 60 that her father didn't love her, when the exact opposite was true. I didn't talk to her about cake. It didn't even come up. She just stopped eating it. She would have still had it when she went out for a cup of tea with her friends, of course. She's 60. Anyway, <laughs> you get the message. <laughs> she was the sweetest little daintiest lady. Anyway, my point is that when you battle, when you hear all this delicious, juicy, inspiring, inspired information and you know in your heart it's right. There'll be days when you find it's effortless and there might be days where you struggle. If you judge yourself, you'll spend another three days, three weeks, three months going down the unresourceful eating path. If you can catch yourself and realise that you haven't ruined anything when you have a day like that, the best question you can ask yourself is, I wonder what led me here. Did you eat something that wasn't nutritious in the middle of the afternoon because your lunch wasn't nourishing enough? You need more fat at lunch, probably. Or did you eat the sweet food in the middle of the afternoon because you had a conversation with someone and if you're honest, it hurt your feelings. And so you're trying to numb that pain. So you want to bring awareness to your food choices, not just with their nourishment factor, but when you find it hard, you want to bring awareness to why that might be. Because you are so worth taking care of, it's believing that so that you can then act on it. So my books are here uh, with me. I have a table out in the, in the little foyer. Uh, I've touched on Sweet Food Story, the uh, cookbook I created to really support people to make healthy whole food, sweet food choices at any time of the day. Most of them can be frozen, so they're great to make on a Sunday and have ahead of time and then Real Food Chef and Real Food Kitchen with everyday part uh, included. Uh, they're very simple. A lot of them can be made in, blender, in a blender, for example, uh, and, um, as I said, all made from whole real food so that your body is able to get the nutrients that it needs. And then, of course, Accidentally Overweight, that very first book that I wrote, is still to this day one of my favourites because it really helps people to understand all those messages that the body gets about whether it needs to burn fat or store fat. The other thing I want to just touch on before I finish is uh, the weekend that I have coming up. I run Women's Health Weekends usually twice a year. They're my favourite thing to do. Uh, the next one is being held in Sydney at, on Level 7 of David Jones on June 4 and 5. There's also one in Auckland on June 11 and 12. It's 20 hours of my time across the weekend where we do a great big deep dive on all of the body systems. We spend a lot of time on sex hormones and how to get them back into balance. I teach you all my restorative practices to activate that green zone. I bring in a beautiful restorative yoga teacher and we do a big emotional exploration, really answering that question, why do you do what you do? 
Uh, I also guide you to create a plan of action tailored to your own needs, so you leave knowing what food to eat, if you need herbal medicine, for example, all those things are guided and you leave with a plan of action to know exactly what you need to do. It's normally $1,295 for the weekend, uh, but today it is $895 and you can have three of my books for free to take with you if that appeals. So if you'd like to be part of that or you want more information, I'll be in the foyer in the lunch break, so come and have a chat. My, my contact information uh, is there. So I sincerely hope that you've learned something insightful today about how your body works. The reason I want you to understand those inner workings is because if you can see amazing health as 50 or 60 or 80 or 100 little tiny choices every day, will I eat this or this? Will I go back for seconds or stay where I am? Will I go for a walk or stay on the couch? In every little second, you're making a decision about which one to do. So if you can see it, rather than, if for some of you, if you're beginning a journey with really supporting your health and taking a big step forward in coming here today, I commend you for it. And instead of seeing it as a great big challenge, just see it as those tiny little decisions each day. And you want to mostly make amazing choices. And to do that, you want to stay in touch with how precious life is and you want to stay in touch with how precious you are and then treat yourselves accordingly. Thank you so much.